After his father's death, Alexander III began to undo the work that had been done, forcing the Western influence out of view and introducing a new repression over his opponents. He also began changing the inner mechanisms of the educational system. To accomplish such goals, he used both the church and military force under his control. The reforms enacted through his lifetime became a new basis as to the role of Tsars in Russia and a new order for the country as a whole. It is important to first look at the version of Russia that Alexander was born into, a Russia plagued by a lack of governmental respect due to insufficient control policies. His father, Alexander II, was in large a people's man, and argued for a more socialistic environment where there were no serfs, a free and just judicial system, and a powerful nationwide educational system. He succeeded in his seventh year in reign when the Emancipation Manifesto was presented on, to the public on March 3rd, 1861 at St. Petersburg, Russia. It began with these famous words. By the grace of God we, Alexander II, Emperor and Autocrat of all Russia, King of Poland and Grand Duke of Finland, make known to all our faithful subjects, called by divine providence and by the sacred right of inheritance to the Russian throne, to our ancestors, we vowed in our hearts to respond to the mission which is entrusted to us and to surround with our affection and our imperial solicitude all our faithful subjects of every rank and condition, from the soldiers who nobly from the soldier who nobly defends the country to the humble artesian who works in industry, from the career official of the state to the plowman who tills the soil. Despite the success of the manifesto, most of the Russian serf population remained as hired help for the state and privately owned land. This was due to the redemptive payments which were owed to their former lords and the rapid growth in population. Work was not easy to find. It was because of this that revolts began to break out against the Tsar. This began the Mad Summer of 1874. It was a time of governmental promise and a lack of fulfillment, where the people took it into their own hands to create higher class jobs as doctors and teachers for themselves. On top of this, many revolutionist groups began to form, one of the most, most prominent being Narodnaya Vola, which was comprised of a very few strong-willed and spirited men whose aim was to disorganize the government by assassinating officials and eventually the Tsar, Alexander II. And on March 13, 1881, they succeeded. After a first failed attempt, a second bomb was thrown at Alexander's feet, and he perished in the blast, leaving the Russian country to his son, Alexander III. Not ten days had passed when the Narodnaya Vola sent this letter to the soon-to-be Tsar. Your Majesty, while fully comprehending your deep sorrow, the Executive Committee would not be justified in postponing this explanation out of a feeling of natural delicacy. There is something higher than the most legitimate of personal feelings. It is the duty to our country to which all individual sentiments must be sacrificed. The issue remains unchanged. It is the circumstances of the age that create revolutionaries, the whole nation's discontent, the urge of all Russia towards a new social order. There are but two ways, either revolution, inevitable, unavertable by any executions, or the voluntary transfer of supreme power into the hands of the people. We turn to you, disregarding that suspicion which misdeeds of the administration have aroused. We turn to you as a citizen of our country and as a man of honor. And so, your majesty, decide. There are two ways before you. The choice to be made is yours. We can only beg of fate that your judgment and your conscience will lead you to choose the only path consistent with the good of Russia, with your honor, and with your duty. Without personally taking it to heart, the young Alexander ascended into the Russian imperial throne the day of his father's death. But it wasn't until 1883 that he was officially crowned the Tsar of Russia, where he gave the accustomed welcoming proclamation speech which, in Alexander's case, was written by his advisor and tutor, Konstantin Pobdonosev, who held a heavy influence in his early reign. It is Pobdonosev that took what was said by the Narod Vola into account and advised the new Tsar to distrust the people and that only a harsh and controlled government, one in opposition to his father's, would keep the people in line and prevent future revolts. In a letter he wrote to Alexander, Pobdonosev stated, 
If they begin to sing the old siren song, that it is necessary to be calm and to continue in the liberal direction, that it is necessary to yield to so-called public opinion, for God's sake, your majesty, do not believe and do not listen. It will be the ruin of Russia and of you. This is as clear as day to me. It is necessary to end at once, now, of all the talk about freedom of the press, about popular meetings, about a representative assembly. These are all lies spoken by superficial and weak people. It is absolutely essential to reject them for the good of the true people. Abiding closely to his tutor's advice, Alexander passed the Imperial Manifesto to begin his reform in correcting the mistakes he viewed his father had enacted. This was also known as Russification. This new plan began with the colonization of all non-Russian territories of the empire, enforcing upon them the educational system, language, and customs of Russia, as well as a strict governmental rule over the people residing in these territories. The schools being erected in these providences were focused upon religious teachings and the teachings of the Russian language, but ended there. Because of his strive for a total governmental control, Alexander attempted to keep the middle and lower classes out of university education settings. Only the aristocratic portion of society had the pleasures of obtaining a higher level of education. Over 73% of all nobles during this period attended university, gaining the same, if not better, instruction than the best schools in Europe. Due to the segregation between the lower and upper classes, Russia was beginning to strive academically but fall short in industry. To counter this, Alexander appointed Ivan von Gradsky as the head of Ministry of Finance in 1887, in an effort to increase production and raise Russia to again be one of the influential powers in Europe. Vyshengradsky strove towards growing the influence of Russia and increasing governmental wealth flow. To do so, he increased direct taxes, pushed for an export drive, increased railway lines, and developed a stronger tariff set specifically for the peasant population. It began to work as the industrial Russia grew, but in 1891 a famine broke out among the lower class population and over 375 peasants and serfs perished. Because of this tragedy, Baron Bratsky was forced to resign. An official of the railway industry by the name of Sergei Witt took his position and began to set tariffs on workers immediately, increasing the flow of wealth into the building sectors of the Russian government. This allowed for a new educational system to train personnel for industry. In particular, it created a new commercial school, where the students learned how to create with their hands. And from these establishments came a new generation of Russian workers known as the Blue Collar Working Class. And it was this young generation that, along with the guidance of Wit, built and expanded the Trans-Siberian Railway. Track laid out over 5,753 miles, stretching from Moscow to Vladiskov, stopping on the northern border of China and passing through Mongolia and Manchurian empires. With the much-needed influence from China and the eastern countries, Russia adopted the gold standard to place upon its currency the ruble, doubling the value and increasing the country's wealth. Shortly before Alexander became ill and was bedridden, did the country spring into industrial life and bring to strive on its own production and labor force. Not quite what he had envisioned, but nonetheless, he had reformed enough of his father's policies to bring Russia out of its economic and political downturn. And for the Tsars and centuries following him, Alexander III was seen as a model, and his ideals of a self-governmental-run Russia live strongly through today.